Section 1 of The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4. Edited by Seba Smith and Lawrence Leibri. Section 1. A piece of a hundred sous. A young and a handsome couple had just returned from the altar, where their destinies were irrevocably united. They were about to start for the country, and they had bidden a temporary farewell to the friends who were present at the ceremony. For a short time, while the equipage was preparing, they found themselves alone. The newly wedded husband took one of his bride's hands in his own. Allow me, my dear Marie, said he, thus to hold your hand, for dread lest you should quit me. I dread lest all this be an illusion. It seems to me that I am the hero of one of those fairy tales which amused my boyhood and in which, in the hour of happiness, some malignant fairy steps in to throw the victim into grief and despair. Reassure yourself, my dear Frederic, said the lady. I was yesterday the widow of Sir James Melton, and today I am Madame de la Tour, your wife, your own Marie. Banish from your mind the idea of the fairy. This is not a fiction, but a history. Frédéric de la Tour had some reason to suppose that his fortunes were the work of a fairy's wand, for in the course of two short months, by a seemingly inexplicable stroke of fortune, he had been raised to happiness and to wealth beyond desires. A friendless orphan, twenty-five years old, he had been the holder of a clerkship, which brought him a scanty livelihood, when one day, as he passed along the Rue Saint Honoré, a rich equipage stopped suddenly before him, and a young and elegant woman called from it to him. Monsieur, monsieur, said she, at the same time, on a given signal, the footman leaped down, opened the carriage door, and invited Frederick to enter. He did so, though with some hesitation and surprise, and the carriage started off at full speed. I have received your note, sir, said the lady to Monsieur de la Tour, in a very soft and sweet voice. And spite of your refusal, I hope yet to see you tomorrow evening at my party. To see me, madame? cried Frederic. Yes, sir, you. Ah, a thousand pardons, continued she with an air of confusion. I see my mistake. Forgive me, sir, you are so like a particular friend of mine. What can you think of me? Yet the resemblance is so striking that it would have deceived anyone. Of course, Frederick replied politely to these apologies. Just as they were terminated, the carriage stopped at the door of a splendid mansion, and the young man could do no less than offer his arm to Lady Melton, as the fair stranger announced herself to be. Her extreme beauty charmed Monsieur de la Tour, and he congratulated himself upon this happy accident which had gained him such an acquaintance. Lady Melton loaded him with civilities, and he received and accepted an invitation for the party spoken of. Invitations to other parties followed, and to be brief, the young man soon found himself an established visitant at the house of Lady Melton. She, a rich and youthful widow, was encircled by many admirers, 
one by one, however, disappeared, giving way to the poor clerk, who seemed to engross the lady's thoughts. Finally, almost by her own asking, they were betrothed. Frederick used to look sometimes at the little glass which hung in his humble lodging and wonder to what circumstance he owned his happy fortune. He was not ill-looking, certainly, but he had not vanity to think his appearance magnificent, and his plain and scanty wardrobe prevented him from giving the credit to his tailor. He used to conclude his meditations by the reflection that assuredly the lovely widow was fulfilling some unavoidable award of destiny. As for his own feeling, the lady was lovely, young, rich, accomplished, and noted for her sensibility and virtue. Could he hesitate? My dear Frederic, said the lady smilingly, sit down beside me and let me say something to you. The young husband obeyed, but still did not quit her hand. She began. Once on a time, Frederic started and half seriously exclaimed, Heavens, it is a fairy tale. Listen to me, foolish boy, resumed the lady. There was once a young girl, the daughter of parents well-born and at one time rich, but who had declined sadly in circumstances. Until her fifteenth year, the family lived in lines depending entirely for subsistence upon the labor of her father. Some better hopes sprang up and induced them to come to Paris, but it is difficult to stop in the descent down the path of misfortune. For three years the father struggled against poverty, but at last died in a hospital. The mother soon followed, and the young girl was left alone the occupant of a garret of which the rent was not paid. If there was any fairy connected with this story, this was the moment for her appearance, but none came. The young girl remained alone, without friends or protectors, harassed by debts which she could not pay, and seeking in vain for some species of employment. She found none. Still, it was necessary for her to have food. The night that followed was sleepless. Next day she was again without food, and the poor girl was forced into the resolution of begging. She covered her face with her mother's veil, the only heritage she had received, and stooping so as to imitate age, she went out into the streets. When there, she held out her hand. Alas, that hand was white and youthful and delicate. She felt the necessity of covering it up in the folds of the wheel, as if it had been leprosite. Thus concealed, the poor girl held out the hand to a young woman who passed, one more happy than herself, and asked, A sou, a single sou, to get bread. The petition was unheeded. An old man passed. The mendicant thought that experience of the distresses of life might have softened one like him, but she was in error. Experience had only hardened, not softened his heart. The night was cold and rainy and the hour had come when the police appeared to keep the streets clear of mendicants and suspicious characters. At this period, the shrinking girl took courage once more to hold out her hand to a passerby. It was a young man. He stopped at the silent appeal, and diving into his pockets, pulled out a piece of money, which he threw to her being apparently afraid to touch a thing so miserable. Just as he did this, one of the police came to the spot and, placing his hand on the girl's shoulder, 
exclaimed, Ah, I have caught you, have I? You are begging to the office with you. Come along. The young man here interposed. He took hold hastily of the mendicant, whom he had before seemed afraid to touch, and addressing himself to the policeman, said reprovingly, This woman is not a beggar. No, she is, she is one whom I know. But sir, said the officer, I tell you she is an acquaintance of mine, said the young stranger. Then, turning to the girl, whom he took for an old woman, he continued, Come along, my good dame, and permit me to see you safely to the end of the street. Giving his arm to the unfortunate girl, he led her away, saying, Here is a piece of a hundred sous. It is all I have. Take it, poor woman. The crown of a hundred sous passed from your hand into mine, continued the lady, and as you walked along, supporting my steps, I then, through my veil, distinctly saw your face and figure. My figure, said Frederick in amazement. Yes, my friend, your figure, returned his wife. It was to me you gave alms on that night. It was my life, my honor, perhaps, that you then saved. You, a mendicant, you, so young, so beautiful, and now so rich, cried Frederick. Yes, my dearest husband, replied the lady. I have in my life received alms once only, and from you, and those alms have decided my fate for life. On the day following that miserable night, an old woman, in whom I had inspired some sentiments of pity, enabled me to enter into the family of an English gentleman, a bachelor, who was then with his two sisters residing in Paris. She gave me a letter of presentation and recommendation. I felt very thankful for this. I hastily prepared myself in my best apparel, adapting it as near as possible in such a manner as seemed least like the fashion of the city, and departed for the residence of Sir James Melton. With a beating heart did I approach the door. I knocked. It seemed not half as hard as the throbbing in my bosom. The door was opened by an elderly woman, the housekeeper. Why I was not frightened from my purpose, I cannot tell, for a more forbidding and severe face I never saw. Perhaps I trembled at the misery of the past. I stated my object, showed my letter, and the woman looked more cross, and I felt more miserable. She told me that the ladies were out, that there was no one at home but Sir James. I could see him, but she thought there could scarce be any need of me, and I must have been mistaken. I felt sick at heart. I thought of my dead parents and envied them. Discouraged by this repulse, I turned to depart when I heard within the sound of a gentleman's voice. The few first words I could not understand, but he ended by ordering the cross old housekeeper to show me in. I entered his room. The first sight of him gave me hope. He spoke, and his kind tones assured me. He was sitting at a table, in his morning gown, engaged in writing. He inquired my business and I handed to him the letter, which he opened and read. Then, asking me a few questions, he remarked that his sisters were both out, but that I had better wait for their return. In the meantime, the old lady seemed no well-pleased witness of the scene, standing with her hands upon the back of Sir James' chair. I had not waited more than half an hour before the ladies returned. 
Sir James made known to them the object of my call, which ended in my being engaged. Cheerfulness returned to me with labor. I had the good fortune to become a favorite, and indeed I did my best to merit it. One day, when I had been in the family about six months, Sir James asked me to give him my history. I did so, and he seemed much struck with it. The result was that he sat down by my side one day and asked me plainly if I would marry him. Marry you? cried I in surprise. Sir James Melton was a man of sixty. In answer to my exclamation of astonishment, he said, Yes, I ask if you will be my wife. I am rich, but have no comfort, no happiness. My relatives seem to yearn to see me in the grave. I have ailments which require a deep degree of kindly care, but that is not to be bought from servants. I have heard your story and believe you to be one who will support prosperity as well as you have done adversity. I make my proposal sincerely and I hope you may agree to it. At that time, Frederic, continued the lady, I loved you. I had seen you but once, but the occasion was too memorable for me ever to forget it and something always insinuated to me that we were to pass through life together. Yet everyone around me pressed me to accept the offer made to me, and the thought struck me that I might one day make you wealthy. At length, my only objection to Sir James Melton's proposal lay in a disinclination to make myself the instrument of vengeance in Sir James's hands against the relatives whom he might dislike without good grounds. The objection, when stated, only increased his anxiety for my consent, and finding it would be carrying Romans the length of folly to reject the advantageous settlement offered to me, I consented to Sir James's proposal. This part of my story, Frederick, is like a fairy tale. I, the poor orphan, penniless and friendless, became the wife of one of the richest baronets of England. Dressed in silks and sparkling with jewels, I could now pass in my carriage through the streets where a few months before I had stood in the rain and darkness, a mendicant. Happy Sir James, cried Monsieur de la Tour at this part of the story. He could prove his love by enriching you. He was happy, resumed the lady. Our marriage, so strangely assorted, proved much more conducive, it is probable, to his comfort than if he had wedded one with whom all the parrot of settlements and pin money would have been necessary. Never, I believe, did he for an instant repent of our union. I, on my part, conceived myself bound to do my best for the solace of his declining years, and he, on his part, thought it incumbent on him to provide for my future welfare. He died, leaving me a large part of his substance, as much indeed as I could prevail upon myself to accept. I was a widow, and from the hour in which I became so, I would never again consent to give my hand to a man except to him who had succored me in my hour of distress and whose remembrance had ever been preserved in the recesses of my heart. But how to discover that man? Ah, unconscious Ingrid, to make no endeavor to come in the way of one who sought to love, to cherish you, 
In vain I looked for you at balls, assemblies and theatres. You went not there. As the lady spoke, she took from her neck a ribbon to which was attached a piece of a hundred sous. It is the same, the very same which you gave me, said she, presenting it to Frederic. By pledging it, I got credit from a neighbor for a little bread, and I earned enough afterwards in time to permit me to redeem it. I vowed never to part with it. Ah, oh, how happy I was, Frederic, when I saw you in the street. The excuse which I made for stopping you was the first which arose to my mind. But what terrors I felt even afterwards, lest you should have been already married. In that case, you would never have heard aught of this fairy tale, though I would have taken some means or others to serve and enrich you. I would have gone to England, and there passed my days, in regret perhaps, but still in peace. But happily, it was to be otherwise. You were single. Frederic de la Tour was now awakened, as it were to the full certainty of his happiness. What he could not but before look upon it a sort of freak of fancy in a young and wealthy woman was now proved to be the result of deep, kindly feeling most honorable to her who entertained it. The heart of the young husband overflowed with gratitude and affection to the lovely and noble-hearted being who had given herself to him. He was too happy to speak. His wife first broke silence. So, Frederic, said she gaily, you see that if I am a fairy, it is you that have given me the wand, the talisman that has affected all. End of section one. Section 2 of The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4, edited by Seba Smith and Lawrence Labrie. Section 2 The Student of Esslingen. Books dreams are each a world wordsworth there was at one time in the university of esslingen a young student named herder whose retired habits and excessive application to books had gained him some notice from the heads of his college while by his beer-drinking fellow-students he was scarcely known out of the lecture-room for while they made up noisy parties and drank and smoked sang Walston quarrelled he was bent over some book in his poor lodging on the outskirts of the city german students not living within the walls of their colleges and his hours were spent in toiling but for one object the attainment of college honours by which he would at once receive the qualifications for a pastor one night near the close of june the beauty of the weather seduced him from his desk and he took the road out of the city and strolling along beneath limes and oak trees watched the last green tinge left in the skies by the departed sunlight and lulled by the serenity of the hour he fell into a reverie upon his own hopes and prospects castles in the air are the bright inheritance of the young and the poor student continued to build them while the twilight deepened and the stars gleamed faintly over his path suddenly his dream was broken by the sound of carriage wheels coming at a great rate along the road then there were shouts a whirring sound and a crash and hurrying forward herder saw four plunging horses held by postilions and a carriage overturned on the roadside a groom was assisting a lady through the door and the student hastened to her help also she was easily extricated and herder expressed his hopes that she had not been hurt 
and when she answered he perceived that she was closely masked but her air was highly distinguished and her person noble and he became interested with the singularity of his adventure the lady declined his offer to see her to a house in the neighbourhood while the carriage was righted and she remained standing at the roadside and conversed with him among other questions which she asked with the air of a person not in the habit of having her wishes questioned she inquired if he had come from esslingen and on learning that he was at the university desired to know the nature of his studies and his future designs with a naivete that astonished the diffident student there was however something so charming in the manner of this woman her remarks bespoke so much cultivation of mind and her whole bearing toward him was so gracious that when the carriage was ready he was about to beg her to let him know with whom he had the honour of conversing but he thought of her mask and modestly refrained when she was seated she bent forward and once more thanked him for his attention to her and said in a soft sweet voice good night i shall see you again he could just perceive by the light of the carriage lamps two deep blue eyes through the mask bent earnestly upon his face and confused and delighted he stood motionless for some minutes till the carriage was lost to his sight the high tinge of romance in herder's mind was excited by the occurrence of the evening he did not open his books when he returned to his lodgings every object in it looked strange and mean a new feeling possessed him he sat at the open window and gazed at the distant light and heard the hum of the city and felt more dissatisfied with his lot than he had ever been before in the three years of privation and unceasing study that he had passed there how worthless seemed his pursuits what a waste of youth and the faculties of enjoyment never till this moment had obscurity seemed to him so oppressive a curse and at last when wearied with the burden of saddening thoughts he sought his bed and slept dream followed dream and all of which that fair mask with those beautiful and meaning eyes seemed ever to be before him day followed day herder had returned to his books and found in them that calm which perhaps is their greatest detraction to the unhappy but he wrote more than usual his thoughts flowed into verse and now wild and glowing now sad and bitter poem after poem was rapidly composed on the third evening from that of his remembered meeting with the lady he had lighted his lamp and arranged his books and casting one look on the pleasant gardens without lighted by the summer moon had closed the casement when he was startled by the sound of faint music that seemed to be within his chamber he smiled and thought it could be only fancy no there again and a low chanting was heard at his door the sounds were so spiritual that when they melted away herder stood breathless always imaginative his secluded life had left him peculiarly open to supernatural impressions he sprang to the door and when he had opened it the masked lady glided into the room she stood for a moment in silence regarding the objects around her and then turning to poor herder who looked on in amazement she murmured in a melancholy voice i said that i should see you again and this is your home she continued fixing upon him those dangerous eyes and added in an almost pitying tone and are you happy the blood mounted to the pale cheek of the student at the strangeness of the question yet there was such an indefinite grace mingled with her air of command that herder was almost charmed by her abruptness without seeming to expect an answer to her question she turned to his desk and glancing at the papers upon it she exclaimed ah i see you are a poet and remained for some time attentively reading his recent writings and then praised them with an enthusiasm that quite transported the author she begged that she might keep them and was not refused at this moment the clocks in the city were heard striking nine julius she said he started for he had not told her his christian name julius i have travelled far to-night that i might see you and i wish you to return with me i can display to your eyes a scene such as poets have fabled but which is invisible in the dim world where our wildest and most fantastic thoughts have a shape and life where the ideal spirit of beauty that we have adored in our hearts is infused into breathing miracles of grace and life retains the freshness of youth and glows with the fire of inspiration where she stood the moonlight fell around her through the casement for the lamp burnt dimly the enthusiasm of a prophetess seemed to possess her her neck and arms were of deathly paleness and through her mask her eyes gleamed with a light that turned cold the blood of the student gradually her manner softened and advancing to him she held forth a crystal phial saying drink of this there is a charm in it he hesitated she took his upraised hand drink she repeated persuasively 
the hand clasped in his was soft and warm and felt perfectly mortal confused and yet led away by the fascination of her manner the student took the phial there was magic in the touch of that beautiful hand i will drink said he on condition that you tell me your name and unmask your face my name she said slowly is Sosi. you will behold my features when you have drunk drank of this and pausing suddenly listen she exclaimed and while she spoke strains of airy music floated through the room and a plaintive voice chanted to it life has closed his weary eyes and on a starlit pillow lies awakened sleeps deep mysteries day is done on the pinions of the night thought is taking silent flight through regions of immortal light day is gone the student had drunk of the charm ere the voice was silent a delightful languor overcame him his sight was overloaded the figure of his temptress waxed more and more dim the world had vanished from him when he again unclosed his eyes they were dazzled by the flood of golden light around him exquisite music floated on the air and as he rose from the couch where he had been lying a figure crouching at his feet started up in the shape of one of the piping fawns of antiquity and stood flute in hand regarding him attentively as herder gazed on the scene before him a feeling of intense pleasure filled his being he stood in a colonnade of marble open to the air and beyond it lay in the lustrous moonlight clusters of trees and several buildings of greek architecture a supernatural light fell upon them as if they had been seen through coloured glass at his feet there was a flight of steps which his attendant fawn invited him to descend he did not descend he had no thought but for the objects before him the heaviness of mortality had been shaken off and in his veins there glowed immortal youth ah blessed draught if the work were thine who does not sigh to drink encircled by flowers and ravishing voices that floated on the breath of night he came to a marble basin into which gushed four streams of crystal water from a pedestal in the centre carved around with drooping water lilies and supporting a statue of the despairing hyacinth gazing in vain into that wrinkled fountain for the image of the fatal beauty that immortalized him wandering through the trees to the student came before a building illuminated within and heard the hum of many voices and laughter and singing from an irresistible impulse he ascended the steps to the entrance and as he approached the brazen doors fell slowly back and he stood in the blaze of light which issued through them the guiding fawn was no longer by his side but he advanced to a gallery hung with garlands boys were waving urns of incense about and on couches irregularly placed lay the forms of men and women who seemed insensible to outward impressions their glaring eyes fixed on vacancy but the student only glanced at them his eyes were fascinated by what seemed to be a living statue beside him and what wert thou o form of grace thy brows bound with roses and with ivory arm upraised bearing a crystal vase olympian hebe hast thou indeed forsaken the gods clasped the proverb cup poor student and gaze while yet you may on the flushing bloom of that youthful cheek the charm is almost work he sinks beside her life time and reality are gone crowds of half-perfect forms fill the air and as they gradually combine he beholds a vast hall filled with groups such as we only see in paintings or in dreams animated with new life the student advances he wears a white robe and is crowned with laurel he enters the throng which seems to be pervaded by a general feeling of delight young girls to whose radiant loveliness the fairest sculpture would be cold the work of an inspired pencil dim cling together in attitudes of perfect grace in a buoyant and mazy dance gazing upon these with dreamy and lustreless eyes a man of singular aspect reclined in the midst of the hall he was of low stature and deformed in person with long heavy sallow features but to which the imaginative brow though stamped with care gave strong expression beside him his hand clasped in hers was a woman of the most spiritual beauty but pale to wanness around these two all present seemed to revolve at the instant the student approached them something was addressed to the person we have described by his fair companion he looked up into her face and smiled and the smile did not depart from their features as they regarded the student as he passed sounds of gay laughter attracted him from his path he had beheld an old mean-featured man in the dress of ancient greece listening with a smile to the musical voice of another greek who was crowned with flowers and of an effeminate but a singularly beautiful person the cup of life exclaimed the latter in a triumphant tone should be drained at once believe it dear socrates that if we hoard up its virtues for our maturer age we shall find it dry with time here alcibiades shouted the bystanders socrates gently shook his head and pointed out the dancing girls to his companion as better suited to him than philosophizing upon life they both arose and moved toward them and approaching herder 
alcibiades touched him on the shoulder young poet he said tell my sage friend here which is the better fame or pleasure may not fame be also enjoyment responded the poet good philosophy remarked socrates who proceeded to prove with all the ingenuity of the ancient schools that fame was nothing but pleasure and pleasure in reality fame ah sighed alcibiades had you asked him whether day was night he would have shown beyond dispute that there was in fact no difference between them come some wine my friends and yet he added despondingly even in drinking he is my master but i hate an old clay vessel through which the vine juice never sparkles the sage reclined at the feet of a bronze silenus was freely quaffing from an immense tankard and heard the jibe with stoical indifference but with every draught and they coursed one another like ripples on a stream the wit of alcibiades flashed brighter and brighter the crowd as the hours flew grew more noisy there was a general stir a bacchus crowned with ivy and borne along by a herd of satyrs flourishing branches of the plane tree rushed hither and thither and above the triumphal music that resounded through the hall rang the clanging of cymbals and the air was pierced with flutes the light grew unsteady in the eyes of alcibiades to the poet student the whole world seemed reeling he heard one dizzying shout and then this insubstantial pageant faded herder started from a deep sleep the sun was shining cheerfully into his room he heard the church bells and the patter of many feet on the road he had slept without undressing and now lay striving through the whirl of his brain to recall that which seemed to him to have been a long dream the sounds of music still rang in his ears and when he shut his eyes those exquisite forms were twining in the dance could it be all false and yet so fair and the masked lady was she too the creature of his imagination he rose from his bed to open the window he could not bear the stillness of the room and there on the window seat lay the chaplet of laurel he had worn and a small book beside it this he opened and found it to be his own poems that he had so lately given to the masked lady in print with his name to them on the first page he found these words written in a female hand you will contend for the college prizes venture all the honour will be yours was this he thought again the work of that mocking spirit whose delight seemed to be in perplexing him to what would all this mystery lead and as what must he consider the adventures of the past night if indeed they were real he felt confused and saddened a strange lassitude had crept over him and after remaining for hours at his window it was not till nearly evening that he went forth with dizzy perceptions and a troubled mind to dream at the spot where he had first seen the masked lady time rolled on the student had no more special visits but the events of that night whether true or false worked with painful effect upon him with everyday life he felt nothing in common on the pleasures and the cares of all around he looked with a glazed eye to him the mere sounds of human existence were tedious or irritating but though this dejected and morbid spirit possessed him he still clung to his books for a hidden power seemed to impel him to fulfil the behest conveyed to him with the laurel absorbed in this object he took so little either of rest or food that the good people of the house where he lived at length ventured to counsel him as to the ruin such constant study would bring on his health but instead of the gentleness that formerly characterized the manner of the student their kind interference was met by so stern and bitter a rebuke that they shrunk from all farther communication with him meantime the day for the college examinations approached many an anxious head was on the rack of divinity or metaphysics those like herder to whom present distinction afforded the only chance of future fortune were screwing up their energies for the last desperate and concentrated struggle and all the while with no little anxiety as to the progress of their friends for even in this little arena there flourished a spirit of rivalry worthy of a greater scene envy and jealousy stirred up the most honeyed natures to gall and wormwood ambition was not born a twin among the rest the student pursued with a deep enthusiasm the common object could we have read the dull pages that ever occupied him with his eyes there might have been seen shining above their weary length the images of his kindred and his home that small and obscure village that he left on foot three years back for eslingen he might perhaps return to as a blessing to those he loved honoured and independent we sometimes make great sacrifices to our household gods whether we watch the struggles of ambition in the senate the college or even the theatre there is ever a hidden sympathy that seems to string our own faculties for the strife before us we gain a reflected sense of power and ride on the whirlwind and partake the gale raised by the stormy passions of others in a college examination there is however an interest apart from the strife of parties the candidates are young in mind and hope their unworn energies just armed for a nobler fight 
the world before them with its hard and ill-judging estimate of their powers perhaps success but how much of hope deferred and talent thrown away the day dawned at last by noon the students had filled the great hall of the university and fell into groups as acquaintanceship led them with for the most part grave and absorbed faces and only occasionally exchanged a word or two some who knew they had no chance in the approaching contention treated the matter gaily and their light jests flew about that sombre hall which for centuries had seen within its walls similar scenes and it echoed to the footsteps of their ancestors the entrance of the examiners increased the hum of voices for a moment and then subdued them they came in habited in their robes of state and took their seats on a raised part of the hall at the upper end in the light of a large stained-glass window through which gleams of many-coloured light rested on the antique masonry of the walls the examination papers were then distributed and to the stir caused by this succeeded a long silence as each student became engrossed in the questions allotted to him as the papers were completed they were sent back to the examiners and many hours passed in unbroken labour of the brains and then when the whole number were collected the examiners retired to decide on the victorious candidate the crowd was again broken up into parties no longer silent but explaining disputing and questioning and declaring the number of questions that each competitor had answered to herder's dismay he found that in point of numbers he stood very low but among the crowd no one thought of questioning him he was unknown the more fortunate attracted knots of listeners around them and one especially from the great advantage he had over the rest in the number of his answers drew around him a circle of those who relied on his success and his name was whispered from one to the other all over the hall herder's heart sank within him was he about to fail in his dearest object did the long and weary hours he had toiled through to attain it now indeed avail him not and the prediction with the wreath was that a cheat perhaps merely the hoax of some of those around him he had set all upon this cast and here was his reward dejected and weary he leaned against a column of the hall his eyes watching with all the intentness that we devote often to trivial objects while some great affair is pending the party-coloured rays that fell upon the flagstones ask a criminal on trial for his life and he will confess with what painful minuteness he has examined the sprigs of rosemary strewn before him fevered by the exertions of the morning he gloomily awaited the proclamation of the name of the successful candidate and in despair at his certain failure what bitterness he experienced in that hour gradually however his mind to relieve itself from the deadliest of all pangs excepting that of love betrayed the pang of ruined ambition revived in him almost forgotten feelings little circumstances that came shining through the mist of time bright and endearing recollections of his childish years fell on his jaded spirits like memories of another life how he longed through the fret and fever of life to be lying dead and untroubled by his father's side in the quaint and well-remembered churchyard of his native place at length his dream was dissipated a general stir announced the re-entrance of the examiners every ear was now strained to catch the victorious name of the first in their ranks one might have thought too by their intensity of gaze that they strove to gather the fact out of the impassable faces of the judges herder shrunk from hearing the coming sound so fatal to him and those he loved a breathless silence pervaded every part of the hall so keenly that it was almost painful the chief examiner rose almost immediately and they heard with an effect like that of an electric shock the two words julius herder amid a continuation of the death-like silence he made his way half stunned to the seat of judgment when the examiner in a silvery voice that rang clearly through the lofty building addressed him to this effect julius herder i have now with the undivided concurrence of my brother examiners to confer upon you the highest distinction which this university can bestow on a student and we cannot allow so richly merited an honour as the professorship of poetry to pass from our hands without expressing the high sense of gratification that your obtaining it affords us i have by command of the grand duke the pleasure of delivering this to you at the same time herder received a sealed packet and through the crowd that on all sides made way for him he gained the doors wonder-stricken and scarcely yet awakened to a full sense of his triumph he traversed the college gardens with uncertain steps the packet he found to contain an appointment of value to the service of the grand duke's sister with an order to attend on the court on the next day how soothingly came the light warm summer wind against his thought-worn cheek his toils forgotten the prediction true the object gained he hastened to his lodging and wrote to his family in the singleness of his heart that he should soon be with them as the evening closed in he strolled full of sweet and pleasant thoughts to the spot where the carriage had been overturned a place so full to him of some dim 
influence his guardian spirit however did not appear to congratulate him and with a light heart he retraced his steps to his lodging and for one night gave his books a holiday the simplicity of manners in the german courts will account for the little anxiety of herder respecting his appearance the next day at that of the grand duke it was not necessary to hire a livery and sword to appear in as at more ostentatious exhibitions before royalty so that an early hour in his simple college dress he reached the palace and walked unquestioned into the state apartments many persons were standing around the grand duke so as to entirely conceal him from herder who from the great retirement of his life had never seen him as he stood near the door awaiting an opportunity of presenting himself a young military officer covered with orders passed in and as he went by herder bowed slightly and smiled the student felt certain that he had seen him before but could not recall upon what occasion many other faces seemed singularly familiar to him at last he approached the grand duke and as a person before him made way he advanced and was presented by a chamberlain but what was his amazement nay almost horror to behold in the grand duke himself the deformed and remarkable man who reclined in the centre of the visionary hall he had little time to observe him closely for after a few kind words expressed in a faint and languid voice he said that his sister would receive the student in her apartments and then the crowd pressed forward and heard her passed on the young officer he had before noticed again passed with an elderly nobleman whose arm he held both saluted herder and did he see aright or were they indeed the socrates and alcibiades of his dream naturally puzzled he walked onward to the duchess's apartments in so abstracted a mood that had it not been for one of her pages who caught his arm he certainly would have fallen headlong into her presence the page hastily announced him and on entering he saw no one in the room but a woman of elegant figure whose back was toward him and who as she turned revealed to his astonished eyes the masked lady she held forth her hand he knelt and kissed it full of a crowd of emotions that brought a choking sensation in his throat and an agitation so violent as could not fail to be perceived by the beautiful woman before whom he knelt she desired him to rise and said smilingly as you are now to be my secretary it is time to clear up the mystery of the mask this she took off and the bewildered student beheld the same exquisite person as sat in that scene of mysteries with the person he now found to be the grand duke you will forgive my using magic towards you she continued but the spell is now ended you will learn from others the secret of what you have seen to me the scenes you have beheld were raised for too painful an object to allow me willingly to dwell on the subject farewell for the present but i should perhaps tell you that your poetry has grown into wonderful popularity and has travelled to weimar and been approved of there she ceased and her secretary left her in a mood between laughing and crying was he perplexed at finding his unknown to be a duchess deep in reverie he was returning through the state apartments when he succeeded in stumbling over a sharp-eyed little man in a very slovenly dress powdered down the front with a profusion of snuff ah exclaimed he when he had recovered his legs herder my dear fellow i have been dying to meet with you i salute you as an old friend as i know you already through your book so you are coming among us i you know am court poet devilish dull work here i only keep myself alive by the judicious use of epigrams you see what mischief springs out of ennui you have been i think to the immortal regions as the fools here call a pretty invention of his highnesses for killing time you talked with alcibiades as that hare-brained count calls himself ah bah he bids fair to excel his model in debauchery but what does it all mean interrupted herder pray inform me or i shall be really as mad as every one else seems to be why said the poet after a long pinch of snuff as he put on a malicious sneer our friend the duke has very crazy health and takes opium immensely to keep himself alive being like ourselves something of a genius certainly much too clever for a petty sovereign he has contrived at a country house to sacrifice all the solid comforts of a table and well-chosen wines for the riot and folly of a french masquerade with greek characters and between the wine we drink there to steep our senses in oblivion and some extraordinary opiate administered by a pretty girl who acts hebe very respectably though she originally danced a rope at frankfort fair we manage to make one another believe we are in the elysian fields it is however very well managed and with much taste and imagination but it is the opium in reality that gives it the couleur de rose you shall see my epigram upon it and such was really the intention of the unhappy grand duke to forget in the delirium of opium and in the midst of forms dear to sculpture and painting the loss of health and the deformity of person and the sadness that springs from a sense of life having been unenjoyed who shall know what dreams of beauty what sweet impulses of youth passed in that weary mind when beneath the influence of the fatal charm he appeared to the world a wretched man 
whose dull and joyless eye fell coldly on the loveliness of the world a few years and the poet student heard the requiem performed over his patron's body the spirit so misplaced here had found its resting place of the student of eslingen i can only learn that he ever found in the duchess a charming mistress history says no more and of the rest of that wild court i find that socrates at seventy-six married a girl of sixteen and alcibiades used frequently to have the gout the court poet was dismissed for stealing a pair of the palace candlesticks he revenged himself in a bitter epigram directly he got beyond the grand duke's territory he was lately heard of as a secret agent to the austrian police End of section two. Section three of the Rover, volume one, number four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Rover, volume one, number four. Edited by Seba Smith and Lawrence Labry. Section three. The Soul Cages by Crofton Croker. The Mysterious Depths and wild and wondrous forms of ocean old jack doherty lived on the coast of the county clare jack was a fisherman as his father and grandfather before him had been like them too he lived all alone but for the wife and just in the same spot people used to wonder why the doherty family were so fond of that wild situation so far away from all humankind and in the midst of huge shattered rocks, with nothing but the wide ocean to look upon. But they had their own good reasons for it. The place was just the only spot on that part of the coast where anybody could well live. There was a neat little creek where a boat might lie as snug as a puffin in her nest, and out from this creek a ledge of sunken rocks ran into the sea. Now, when the Atlantic, according to custom, was raging with a storm and a good westerly wind was blowing strong on the coast, many a richly laden ship went to pieces on these rocks, and then the fine bales of cotton and tobacco and such like things, and the pipes of wine and the puncheons of rum and the casks of brandy and the kegs of hollands that used to come ashore dunbeg bay was just like a little estate to the doherty's not but that they were kind and humane to a distressed sailor if ever one had the good luck to get to land and many a time indeed did jack put out in his little cora which though not quite equal to honest andrew hennessy's canvas lifeboat would abreast the billows like any gannet to lend a hand toward bringing off the crew from the wreck but when the ship had gone to pieces and the crew were all lost, who would blame Jack for picking up all he could find? And who is the worst of it? said he. For as to the king, God bless him, everybody knows he's rich enough already without getting what's floating in the sea. Jack, though such a hermit, was a good-natured jolly fellow. No other sure could ever have coaxed biddy mahoney to quit her father's snug and warm house in the middle of the town of ennis and to go so many miles off to live among the rocks with the seals and the seagulls for next-door neighbors but biddy knew that jack was the man for a woman who wished to be comfortable and happy for to say nothing of the fish jack had the supplying of half the gentlemen's houses with godsends that came into the bay and she was right in her choice, for no woman ate, drank, or slept better, or made a prouder appearance at chapel on Sundays, than Mrs. Doherty. Many a strange sight, it may well be supposed, did Jack see, and many a strange sound did he hear, but nothing daunted him. So far was he from being afraid of marrows, or such beings, that the very first wish of his heart was to fairly meet with one. Jack had heard that they were mighty like Christians, and that luck had always come out of an acquaintance with them. Never, therefore, did he dimly discern the marrows moving along the face of the waters in their robes of mist, but he made direct for them, 
and many a scolding did Biddy, in her own quiet way, bestow upon Jack for spending his whole day out at sea and bringing home no fish. Little did poor Biddy know the fish Jack was after. It was rather annoying to Jack that, though living in a place where the marrows were as plenty as lobsters, he never could get a right view of one. What vexed him more was that both his father and grandfather had often and often seen them, and he even remembered hearing when a child how his grandfather, who was the first of the family that had settled down at the creek, had been so intimate with the marrow that only for fear of vexing the priest he would have had him stand for one of his children. This, however, Jack did not well know how to believe. Fortune, at length, began to think that it was only right that Jack should know as much as his father and grandfather did. Accordingly, one day, when he had strolled a little farther than usual along the coast to the northward, just as he turned a point, he saw something, like to nothing he had ever seen before, perched upon a rock at a little distance out to sea. It looked green in the body, as well as he could discern at that distance, and he would have sworn only the thing was impossible, that it had a cocked hat in its hand. Jack stood for a good half hour straining his eyes and wondering at it, and all the time the thing did not stir hand or foot. At last Jack's patience was quite worn out, and he gave a loud whistle and a hail, when the marrow, for such it was, started up, put the cocked hat on its head, and dived down head foremost from the rock. Jack's curiosity was now excited, and he constantly directed his steps toward the point. Still, he could never get a glimpse of the sea gentleman with the cocked hat, and with thinking and thinking about the matter, he began at last to fancy he had been only dreaming. One very rough day, however, when the sea was running mountains high, Jack Doherty determined to give a look at the Marrow's Rock, for he had always chosen a fine day before, and then he saw the strange thing cutting capers upon the top of the rock, and then diving down, and then coming up, and then diving down again. Jack had now only to choose his time, that is, a good blowing day, and he might see the man of the sea as often as he pleased. All this, however, did not satisfy him. Much will have more. He wished now to get acquainted with the marrow, and even in this he succeeded. One tremendous blustering day before he got to the point, whence he had a view of the marrow's rock, the storm came on so furiously that Jack was obliged to take shelter in one of the caves, which are so numerous along the coast, and there, to his astonishment, he saw sitting before him a thing with green hair, long green teeth, a red nose, and pig's eyes. It had a fish's tail, legs with scales on them, and short arms like fins, it wore no clothes, but had the cocked hat under its arm and seemed engaged, thinking very seriously about something. Jack, with all his courage, was a little daunted, but now or never, thought he. So he went boldly to the cogitating fisherman, took off his hat, and made his best bow. Your servant, sir, said Jack. Your servant, kindly, Jack Doherty answered the marrow. To be sure, then, how well your honor knows my name, said Jack. Is it I not know your name, Jack Doherty? Why, man, I knew your grandfather long before he was married to Judy Regan, your grandmother. Ah, oh, Jack, Jack, I was fond of that grandfather of yours. He was a mighty worthy man in his time. I never met his match above or below, before or since, for sucking in a shell full of brandy. I hope, my boy, said the old fellow with a merry twinkle in his little eyes. I hope you're his own grandson. Never fear me for that, said Jack. If my mother had only reared me on brandy, tis myself that would be a sucking infant to this hour. Well, I like to hear you talk so manly, 
you and I must be better acquainted, if it were only for your grandfather's sake. But, Jack, that father of yours was not the thing. He had no head at all. I'm sure, said Jack, since your honor lives down under the water, you must be obliged to drink a power to keep any heat in you in such a cruel, damp, cold place. Well, I've often heard of Christians drinking like fishes, and might I be so bold as to ask where you get the spirits? Where do you get them yourself, Jack? said the marrow, twitching his red nose between his forefinger and thumb. Hubba ba boo, cries Jack. Now I see how it is. But I suppose, sir, your honor has got a fine dry cellar below to keep them in. Let me alone for the cellar, said the marrow, with a knowing wink of his left eye. I'm sure, continued Jack, it must be mighty well worth the looking at. You may say that, Jack, said the marrow. And if you meet me here next Monday, just at this time of the day, we will have a little more talk with one another about the matter. Jack and the marrow parted the best friends in the world. On Monday they met, and Jack was not a little surprised to see that the marrow had two cocked hats with him, one under each arm. Might I take the liberty to ask, sir, said Jack, why your honor has brought the two hats with you today. You would not sure be going to give me one of them to keep for the curiosity of the thing. Oh, no, Jack, said he. I don't get my hat so easily to part with them that way. But I want you to come down and dine with me, and I brought you the hat to dive with. Lord bless and preserve us, cried Jack in amazement. Would you want me to go down to the bottom of the salt sea ocean? Sure, I'd be smothered and choked up with the water to say nothing of being drowned. And what would poor Bitty do for me? And what would she say? And what matter what she says, you pinking? Who cares for Bitty squalling? It's long before your grandfather would have talked in that way. Many's the time he stuck that same hat on his head and dived down boldly after me and many's the snug bit of dinner and good shell full of brandy he and I have had together below under the water. Is it really, sir, and no joke? said Jack. Why, then, sorrow from me for ever and a day after, if all be a bit worse man nor my grandfather was? Here goes, but play me fair now. Here's neck or nothing, cried Jack. That's your grandfather all over said the old fellow. So come along then and do as I do. They both left the cave, walked into the sea, and then swam a piece until they got to the rock. The marrow climbed to the top of it, and Jack followed him. On the far side it was as straight as the wall of a house, and the sea beneath looked so deep that Jack was almost cowed. Now, do you see, Jack? said the marrow. Just put this hat on your head and mind to keep your eyes wide open. Take hold of my tail and follow after me and you'll see what you'll see. In he dashed and in dashed Jack after him boldly. They went and they went and Jack thought they'd never stop going. Many a time did he wish himself sitting at home by the fireside with Biddy. Yet where was the use of wishing now when he was so many miles, as he thought, below the waves of the Atlantic? Still he held hard by the marrow's tail, slippery as it was, and at last, to Jack's great surprise, they got out of the water and he actually found himself on dry land at the bottom of the sea. They landed just in front of a nice house that was slated very neatly with oyster shells, and the marrow, turning about to Jack, welcomed him down. Jack could hardly speak what with wonder and what with being out of breath with traveling so fast through the water. He looked about him and could see no living things, barring crabs and lobsters, of which there were plenty walking leisurely about on the sand. Overhead was the sea like a sky, 
and the fishes, like birds, swimming about in it. Why don't you speak, man? said the marrow. I dare say you had no notion that I had such a snug little concern here as this. Are you smothered or choked or drowned, or are you fretting after Biddy, eh? Oh, not myself, indeed, said Jack, showing his teeth with a good-humored grin. But who in the world would have ever thought of seeing such a thing? Well, come along and let's see what they've got for us to eat. Jack really was hungry, and it gave him no small pleasure to perceive a fine column of smoke rising from the chimney, announcing what was going on within. Into the house he followed the marrow, and there he saw a good kitchen right well provided with everything. There was a noble dresser and plenty of pots and pans with two young marrows cooking. His host then led him into the room, which was furnished shabbily enough. Not a table or a chair was there in it, nothing but planks and logs of wood to sit on and eat off. There was, however, a good fire blazing on the hearth, a comfortable sight to Jack. Come now and I'll show you where I keep, you know what, said the marrow with a sly look. And opening a little door, he led Jack into a fine, long cellar, well filled with pipes and kegs and hogsheads and barrels. What do you say to that, Jack Doherty, eh? Maybe a body can't live snug under the water? Never doubt of that, said Jack, with a convincing smack of his underlip that he really thought what he said. They went back to the room and found dinner laid. There was not tablecloth, to be sure, but what matter? It was not always Jack had one at home. The dinner would have been no discredit to the first house of the country on a fast day. The choicest of fish, and no wonder, was there. Turbos and soles and oysters and twenty other kinds were on the planks at once, and plenty of the best of foreign spirits. The wines, the old fellow said, were too cold for his stomach. Jack ate and drank till he could eat no more, then taking up a shell of brandy. Here's to your honor's good health, sir, said he, though, begging your pardon, it's mighty odd that as long as we've been acquainted, I don't know your name yet. That's true, Jack, replied he. I never thought of it before, but better late than ever. My name's Kumara. And a mighty decent name it is, cried Jack, taking another shell full. Here's to your good health, Kumara, and may you live these fifty years to come. Fifty years, repeated Kumara. I'm obliged to you indeed. If you had said five hundred, it would have been something worth the wishing. By the law, sir, cried Jack. You's lived to a powerful great age here underwater. You knew my grandfather, and he's dead and gone better than these sixty years. I'm sure it must be a mighty healthy place to live in. No doubt of it. But come, Jack, keep the liquor stirring. Shell after shell did they empty, and to Jack's exceeding surprise, he found the drink never got into his head, owing, I suppose, to the sea being over them, which kept their noddles cool. Old Kumara got exceedingly comfortable and sung several songs, but Jack, if his life had depended on it, never could remember more than rum fum boodle boo ripple dipple nitty dob dum doo doodle coo raffle taffle chitty bob. It was the course to one of them, and to say the truth, nobody that I know has ever been able to pick any particular meaning out of it, but that, to be sure, is the case with many a song nowadays. At length, said he to Jack, Now, my dear boy, if you follow me, I'll show you my curiosities. He opened a little door and led Jack into a large room, where Jack saw a great many odds and ends that Kumara had picked up at one time or another. What chiefly took his attention, however, were things like lobster pots, ranged on the ground along the wall. Well, Jack, how do you like my curiosities? said old Koo. Upon my smoking, sir, said Jack, they're mighty well worth looking at. 
But might I make so bold as to ask what these things like lobster pots are? Oh, the soul cages, is it? The what, sir? These things here that I keep the souls in. Arrah, what souls, sir? said Jack in amazement. Sure, the fish have not got souls in them. Oh, no, replied Coo, quite coolly. That they have not, but these are the souls of drowned sailors. The Lord preserve us from all harm, muttered Jack. How in the world did you get them? Easily enough, I've only, when I see a good storm coming on, to set a couple of dozen of these, and then when the sailors are drowned and the souls get out of them under the water, the poor things are almost perished to death, not being used to the cold. So they make into my pots for shelter, and then I have them snug and fetch them home and keep them here, dry and warm. And is it not well for them poor souls to get into such good quarters? Jack was so thunderstruck, he did not know what to say, so he said nothing. They went back into the dining room and had a little more brandy, which was excellent. And then, as Jack knew that it must be getting late, and as Biddy might be uneasy, he stood up and said he thought it was time for him to be on the road. Just as you like, Jack, said Coo. But take a duke and duras before you go. You've got a cold journey before you. Jack knew better manners than to refuse the parting glass. I wonder, said he, will I be able to make my way home? What should ail you, said Coo, when I'll show you the way? Out they went before the house, and Kumara took one of the cocked hats and put it upon Jack's head the wrong way, and then lifted him up on his shoulder that he might launch him up into the water. Now, says he, giving him a heave, you'll come up just in the same spot you come down in, and Jack, mind and throw me back the hat. He canted Jack off his shoulder, and up he shot like a bubble, whirr, whirr, whiz. Away he went up through the water till he came to the very rock he had jumped off, where he found a landing place, and then in he threw the hat, which sunk like a stone. The sun was just going down in the beautiful sky of a calm summer's evening. Biscor was seen dimly twinkling in the cloudless heaven, a solitary star, and the waves of the Atlantic flashed in a golden flood of light. So Jack, perceiving it was late, set off home, but when he got there, not a word did he say to Biddy of where he had spent his day. The state of the poor souls cooped up in the lobster pots gave Jack a great deal of trouble, and how to release them cost him a great deal of thought. He at first had a mind to speak to the priest about the matter, but what could the priest do, and what did Koo care for the priest? Besides, Koo was a good sort of an old fellow, and did not think he was doing any harm. Jack had a regard for him, too, and it also might not be too much to his own credit if it were known that he used to go dine with Marrows. On the whole, he thought his best plan would be to ask Ku to dinner and to make him drunk if he was able, and then to take the hat and go down and turn up the pots. It was first of all necessary, however, to get Biddy out of the way, for Jack was prudent enough, as she was a woman, to wish to keep the thing secret from her. Accordingly, Jack grew mighty pious all of a sudden, and said to Biddy that he thought it would be for the good of their souls if she was to go and take her rounds at St. John's Well, near Ennis. Biddy thought so, too, and accordingly off she set one fine morning at day-dawn, giving Jack a chance to have an eye to the place. The coast being clear, away went Jack to the rock to give the appointed signal to Kamara, which was throwing a big stone into the water. Jack threw... And up sprang Coo. Good morrow, Jack, said he. What do you want with me? Just nothing at all to speak about, sir, returned Jack. Only to come and take a bit of dinner with me, if I might make so free as to ask you. And sure, I'm now after doing so. 
It's quite agreeable, Jack, I assure you. What's your hour? Any time that's most convenient to you, sir. Say one o'clock, that you may go home, if you wish, with the daylight. I'll be with you, said Coo. Never fear me. Jack went home and dressed a noble fish dinner and got out plenty of his best foreign spirits, enough for that matter to make twenty men drunk. Just to the minute came Coo, with his cocked hat under his arm. Dinner was ready. They sat down and ate and drank away manfully, Jack thinking of the poor souls below in the pots, plied old Coo well with brandy, and encouraged him to sing, hoping to put him under the table. But poor Jack forgot that he had not the sea over his own head to keep it cool. The brandy got into it and did his business for him, and Coo reeled off home, leaving his entertainer as dumb as a haddock on a good Friday. Jack never woke till the next morning, and then he was in a sad way. "'Tis no use for me thinking to make that old rippery drunk," said Jack. "'And how in this world can I help the poor souls out of the lobster pots?' After ruminating nearly the whole day, a thought struck him. "'I have it,' says he, slapping his knee. "'I'll be sworn that Coo never saw a drop of poteen as old as he is, "'and that's the thing to settle him.' Oh, then is not it well that Biddy will not be home these two days yet. I can have another twist at him. Jack asked Koo again, and Koo laughed at him for having no better head, telling him he'd never come up to his grandfather. Well, but try me again, said Jack, and I'll be bailed to drink you drunk and sober and drunk again. Anything is my power, said Koo, to oblige you. At this dinner, Jack took care to have his own liquor well watered and to give the strongest brandy he had to Coo. At last, says he, Pray, sir, did you ever drink any poteen? Any real Mountain Dew? No, says Coo. What's that, and where does it come from? Oh, that's a secret, said Jack. But it's the right stuff, and never believe me again— if tis not fifty times as good as brandy or rum either. Biddy's brother just sent me a present of a little drop in exchange for some brandy, and as you're an old friend of the family, I kept it to treat you with. Well, let's see what sort of thing it is, said Kumara. The poteen was the right sort. It was first rate and had the real smack upon it. Ku was delighted. He drank and he sung, rum bum biddle boo over and over again, and he laughed and he danced till he fell on the floor fast asleep. Then Jack, who had taken good care to keep himself sober, snapped up the cocked hat, ran off to the rock, leaped in, and soon arrived at Coo's habitation. All was still as a churchyard at midnight. Not a marrow, old or young, was there. In he went and turned up the pots, but nothing did he see, only he heard a sort of a little whistle or chirp as he raised each of them. At this he was surprised, till he recollected what the priest had often said, that nobody living could see the soul, no more than they could see the wind or the air. Having now done all that he could do for them, he set the pots as they were before, and sent a blessing after the poor souls to speed them on their journey, wherever they were going. Jack now began to think of returning. He put the hat on, as was right, the wrong way, but when he got out, he found the water so high over his head that he had no hopes of ever getting up into it. Now that he had not old Kumara to give him a lift, he walked about looking for a ladder, but not one could he find, and not a rock was there in sight. At last he saw a spot where the sea hung rather lower than anywhere else, so he resolved to try there. Just as he came to it, a big cod happened to put down his tail. Jack made a jump and caught hold of it, and the cod, all in amazement, 
gave a bounce and pulled Jack up. The minute the hat touched the water, pop away, Jack was whisked, and up he shot like a cork, dragging the poor cod that he forgot to let go, up with him, tail foremost. He got to the rock in no time, and without a moment's delay hurried home rejoicing in the good deed he had done. But meanwhile there was fine work at home, for our friend Jack had hardly left the house on his soul-freeing expedition when back came Biddy from her soul-saving one to the well. When she entered the house and saw the things lying Thrynahella on the table before her, "'Here's a pretty job,' said she, "'that black guard of mine. What ill luck I had ever to marry him. He has picked up some vagabond or other while I was praying for the good of his soul, and they've been drinking all the poteen that my own brother gave him, and all the spirits to be sure that he was to have sold to his honor. Then, hearing an outlandish kind of grunt, she looked down and saw Kumara lying under the table. The blessed virgin help me, shouted she, if he has not made a real beast of himself. Well, well, I've often heard of a man making a beast of himself with drink. Oh, ho, no, ho, Jack, honey, what will I do with you? Or what will I do without you? How can any decent woman think of living with a beast? With such lamentations, Biddy rushed out of the house and was going she knew not where when she heard the well-known voice of Jack singing a merry tune. Glad enough was Biddy to find him safe and sound, and not turned into a thing that was neither fish nor flesh. Jack was obliged to tell her all, and Biddy, though she had half a mind to be angry with him for not telling her before, owned that he had done a great service to the poor souls. Back they both went most lovingly to the house, and Jack wakened up Kumara, and perceiving the old fellow to be rather dull, he bid him not be cast down, for twas many a good man's case, and said it all came of his not being used to the poteen, and recommended him by way of cure to swallow a hair of the dog that bit him. Ku, however, seemed to think he had had quite enough. He got up quite out of sorts, and without having the manners to say one word in the way of civility, he sneaked off to cool himself by a jaunt through the salt water. Kumara never missed the souls. He and Jack continued the best friends in the world, and no one, perhaps, ever equaled Jack at freeing souls from purgatory, for he contrived fifty excuses for getting into the house below the sea, unknown to the old fellow, and then turning up the pots and letting out the souls. It vexed him to be sure that he could never see them, but as he knew the thing to be impossible, he was obliged to be satisfied. Their intercourse continued for several years. However, one morning, on Jack's throwing in a stone as usual, he got no answer. He flung another and another. Still, there was no reply. He went away and returned the following morning, but it was to no purpose. As he was without the hat, he could not go down to see what had become of old Koo, but his belief was that the old man, or the old fish, or whatever he was, had either died or had moved away from that part of the country. End of section 3《Section 4 of the Rover, Volume 1, Number 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4, edited by Seba Smith and Lawrence Labrie. Section 4. The Stroller's Tale there is nothing marvellous in what i am going to relate there is nothing even uncommon in it want and sickness are too common in many stations of life to deserve more notice than is usually bestowed on the most ordinary vicissitudes of human nature 
i have thrown these few notes together because the subject of them was well known to me for many years i traced his progress downward step by step until at last he reached the excess of destitution from which he never rose again the man of whom i speak was a low pantomime actor and like many people of his class an habitual drunkard in his better days before he had become enfeebled by dissipation and emaciated by disease he had been in the receipt of a good salary which if he had been careful and prudent he might have continued to have received some years not many because these men either die early or by unnaturally taxing their bodily energies lose prematurely those physical powers on which alone they can depend for subsistence his besetting sin gained so fast upon him however that it was found impossible to employ him in the situation in which he really was useful to the theatre the public house had a fascination for him which he could not resist neglected disease and hopeless poverty were as certain to be his portion as death itself if he persevered in the same course yet he did persevere and the result may be guessed he could obtain no engagement and he wanted bread everybody who is at all acquainted with theatrical matters knows what a host of shabby poverty-stricken men hang about the stage of a large establishment not regularly engaged actors but ballet people procession men tumblers and so forth who are taken on during the run of a pantomime or an easter piece and are then discharged until the production of some heavy spectacle occasions a new demand for their services to this mode of life the man was compelled to resort and taking the chair every night at some low theatrical house at once put him in possession of a few more shillings weekly and enabled him to pursue his old propensity even this resource shortly failed him his irregularities were too great to admit of his earning the wretched pittance he might thus have procured and he was actually reduced to a state bordering on starvation only procuring a trifle occasionally by borrowing it of some old companion or by obtaining an appearance at one of the commonest of the minor theatres and when he did earn anything it was spent in the old way about this time and when he had been existing for upward of a year no one knew how i had a short engagement at one of the theatres on the surrey side of the water and here i saw this man whom i had lost sight of for some time for i had been travelling in the provinces and he had been skulking in the lanes and alleys of london i was dressed to leave the house and was crossing the stage on my way out when he tapped me on the shoulder never shall i forget the repulsive sight that met my eye when i turned round he was dressed for the pantomime in all the absurdity of a clown's costume the spectral figures in the dance of death the most frightful shapes that the ablest painter ever portrayed on canvas never presented an appearance half so ghastly his bloated body and shrunken legs their deformity enhanced a hundredfold by the fantastic dress the glassy eyes contrasting fearfully with the thick white paint with which the face was besmeared the grotesquely ornamented head trembling with paralysis and the long skinny hands rubbed with white chalk all gave him a hideous and unnatural appearance of which no description could convey an adequate idea and which to this day i shudder to think of his voice was hollow and tremulous and he took me aside and in broken words recounted a long catalogue of sickness and privations terminating as usual with an urgent request for the loan of a trifling sum of money i put a few shillings in his hand and as i turned away i heard the roar of the laughter which followed his first tumble on to the stage a few nights afterwards a boy put a dirty scrap of paper into my hand on which were scrawled a few words in pencil intimating that the man was dangerously ill and begging me after the performance to see him at his lodgings in some street i forget the name of it now at no great distance from the theatre i promised to comply as soon as i could get away and after the curtain fell sallied forth on my melancholy errand it was late for i had been playing in the last piece and as it was a benefit night the performance had been protracted to an unusual length it was a dark cold night with a chill damp wind which blew the rain heavily against the windows and house fronts pools of water had collected in the narrow and little frequented streets and as many of the thinly scattered oil lamps had been blown out by the violence of the wind the walk was not only a comfortless but most uncertain one i had fortunately taken the right course however and succeeded after a little difficulty in finding the house to which i had been directed a coal shed with one story above it in the back room of which lay the object of my search 
a wretched-looking woman a man's wife met me on the stairs and telling me that he had just fallen into a kind of doze led me softly in and placed a chair for me at the bedside the sick man was lying with his face turned toward the wall and as he took no heed of my presence i had leisure to observe the place in which i found myself he was lying on an old bedstead which turned up during the day the tattered remains of a checked curtain was drawn round the bed's head to exclude the wind which however made its way into the comfortless room through the numerous chinks in the door and blew it to and fro every instant there was a low cinder fire in a rusty unfixed grate and an old three-cornered stained table with some medicine bottles a broken glass and few other domestic articles was drawn out before it a little child was sleeping on a temporary bed which had been made for it on the floor and the woman sat on a chair by its side there was a couple of shelves with a few plates and cups and saucers and a pair of stage shoes and a couple of foils hung beneath them with the exception of little heaps of rags and bundles which had been carelessly thrown into the corners of the room these were the only things in the apartment i had time to note these little particulars and to mark the heavy breathing and feverish starting of the sick man before he was aware of my presence in his restless attempts to procure some easy resting-place for his head he tossed his hand out of the bed and it fell on mine he started up and stared eagerly in my face mr hutley john said his wife mr hutley that you sent for to-night you know ah said the invalid passing his hand across his forehead hutley hutley let me see he seemed to collect his thoughts for a few seconds and then grasping me tightly by the wrist said don't leave me don't leave me old fellow she'll murder me i know she will has he been long so said i addressing his weeping wife since yesterday night she replied john john don't you know me don't let her come near me said the man with a shudder as she stooped over him drive her away i can't bear her near me he stared wildly at her with a look of deadly apprehension and then whispered in my ear i beat her jem i beat her jem i beat her yesterday many times before i've starved her and the boy too and now i am weak and helpless jem she'll murder me for it i know she will if you had seen her cry as i had you know it too keep her off he relaxed his grasp and sunk back exhausted on the pillow i knew but too well what all this meant if i could have entertained any doubt of it for one instant one glance at the woman's pale face and wasted form would have sufficiently explained the real state of the case you had better stand aside said i to the poor creature you can do him no good perhaps he will be calmer if he does not see you she retired out of the man's sight he opened his eyes after a few seconds and looked anxiously round is she gone he eagerly inquired yes yes said i she shall not hurt you i'll tell you what jem said the man in a low voice she does hurt me there's something in her eyes wakes such a dreadful fear in my heart that it drives me mad all last night her large staring eyes and pale face were close to mine wherever i turned they turned and whenever i started from my sleep she was at the bedside looking at me he drew me closer to him and said in a deep alarmed whisper jem she must be an evil spirit a devil hush i know she is if she has been a woman she would have died long ago no woman could have borne what she has i sickened at the thought of the long course of cruelty and neglect which must have occurred to produce such an impression on such a man i could say nothing in reply for who could offer hope or consolation to the abject being before me i sat there for upward of two hours during which time he tossed about murmuring exclamations of pain or impatience restlessly throwing his arms here and there and turning constantly from side to side at length he fell into that state of partial unconsciousness in which the mind wanders uneasily from scene to scene and from place to place without the control of reason but still without being able to divest itself of an indescribable scene of present suffering finding from his incoherent wandering that this was the case and knowing that in all probability the fever would not grow immediately worse i left him promising his miserable wife that i would repeat my visit next evening and if necessary sit up with the patient during the night i kept my promise the last four-and-twenty hours had produced a frightful alteration the eyes though deeply sunk and heavy shone with a lustre frightful to behold the lips were parted and cracked in many places the dry hard skin glowed with a burning heat and there was an almost unearthly air of wild anxiety in the man's face indicating even more strongly the ravages of the disease the fever was at its height i took the seat i had occupied the night before and there i sat for hours listening to the sounds which must strike deep to the heart of the most callous among human beings the awful ravings of a dying man from what i had heard of the medical attendant's opinion 
i knew there was no hope for him i was sitting by his deathbed i saw the wasted limbs which had been distorted for the amusement of a boisterous gallery writhing under the tortures of a burning fever i heard the clown's shrill laugh blending with the low murmurings of the dying man it is a touching thing to hear the mind reverting to the ordinary occupations and pursuits of health when the body lies before you weak and helpless but when those occupations are of a character the most strongly opposed to anything we associate with grave and solemn ideas the impression produced is infinitely more powerful the theatre and the public-house were the chief themes of the wretched man's wanderings it was evening he fancied he had a part to play that night it was late and he must leave home instantly why did they hold him and prevent his going so he should lose his money he must go no they would not let him he hid his face in his burning hands and feebly bemoaned his own weakness and the cruelty of his persecutors a short pause and he shouted out a few doggerel rhymes the last he had ever learned he rose in bed drew up his withered limbs and rolled about in uncouth positions he was acting he was at the theatre a minute's silence and he murmured the burden of some roaring song he had reached the old house at last how hot the room was he had been ill very ill but he was well now and happy fill up his glass who was it that dashed it from his lips it was the same persecutor that had followed him before he fell back upon his pillow and moaned aloud a short period of oblivion and he was wandering through a tedious maze of low arched rooms so low sometimes that he must creep upon his hands and knees to make his way along it was close and dark and every way he turned some obstacle impeded his progress there were insects too hideous crawling things with eyes that stared upon him and filled the very air around glistening horribly amid the thick darkness of the place the walls and ceiling were alive with reptiles the vault expanded to an enormous size frightful figures flitted to and fro and the faces of men he knew rendered hideous by gibing and mouthing peered out from among them they were searing him with heated irons and binding his head with cords till the blood started and he struggled madly for life at the close of one of those paroxysms when a head with great difficulty held him down in his bed he sank into what appeared to be a slumber overpowered with watching and exertion i closed my eyes for a few minutes when i felt a violent clutch on my shoulder i woke instantly he raised himself up so as to seat himself in bed a dreadful change had come over his face but consciousness had returned for he evidently knew me the child who had been long since disturbed by his ravings rose from its little bed and ran toward its father screaming with fright the mother hastily caught it in her arms lest he should injure it in the violence of his insanity but terrified by the alteration of his features stood transfixed by the bedside he grasped my shoulder convulsively and striking his breast with the other hand made a desperate attempt to articulate it was unavailing he extended his arm toward them and made another violent effort there was a rattling noise in the throat a glare of the eye a short stifled groan and he fell back dead End of section four Section five of the Rover Volume One Number four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katrina Dixon. The Rover Volume One Number four. Edited by Sebra Smith and Lawrence Libri. Section number five count julian and his family by washington irving everything for a time prospered with count julian he had gratified his vengeance he had been successful in his treason and had acquired countless riches from the ruin of his country but it is not outward success that constitutes prosperity the tree flourishes with fruit and foliage while blasted and withering at the heart wherever he went count julian read hatred in every eye he tried to persuade himself that he had taken but justifiable vengeance he felt that no personal wrong can justify the crime of treason to one's country for a time he sought in luxurious indulgence to soothe or forget the miseries of the mind he assembled round him every pleasure and gratification that boundless wealth could purchase but all in vain. He had no relish for the dainties of his board. Music had no charm wherewith to lull his soul, and remorse drove slumber from his pillow. He sent to Cueta for his wife Frandina, 
his daughter Florinda, and his youthful son, Alibo, hoping in the bosom of his family to find that sympathy and kindness which he could no longer find in the world. Their presence, however, brought him no alleviation. Florinda, the daughter of his heart, for whose sake he had undertaken such signal vengeance, was sinking a victim to its effects. Wherever she went, she found herself a byword of shame and reproach. The outrage she had suffered was imputed to her as wantonness, and her calamity was magnified into a crime. The Christians never mentioned her name without a curse, and the Muslims, the gainer of her misfortune, spoke of her only by the appellation of Kava, the vilest epithet that they could apply to a woman. But the opprobrium of the world was nothing to the umbraiding of her own heart. She charged herself with all the miseries of these disastrous wars, the deaths of so many gallant cavaliers, the conquest and perdition of her country. The anguish of her mind preyed upon the beauty of her person. Her eye, once soft and tender in its expression, became wild and haggard. Her cheek lost its bloom and became hollow and pallid, and at times there was a desperation in her words. When her father sought to embrace her, she withdrew with shuddering from his arms, for she thought of his treason and the ruin it had brought upon Spain. Her wretchedness increased after her return to her native country, until it rose to a degree of frenzy. One day, when she was walking with her parents in the garden of their palace, she entered a tower, and having barred the door, ascended to the battlements. From thence she called to them in piercing accents, expressive of her insupportable anguish and desperate determination. Let the city, she said, be henceforth called Malacca, in the memorial of the most wretched of women, who therein put an end to her days. So saying, she threw herself headlong from the tower, and was dashed to pieces. The city, adds the ancient chronicler, received the name thus given to it, though softened to Malaga, which still retains the memory of the tragic end of Florinda. The Countess Frandina abandoned this scene of woe, and returned to Cueta, accompanied by her infant son. She took with her the remains of her unfortunate daughter, and gave them honorable sepulcher in a mausoleum of the chapel belonging to the citadel. Count Julian departed for Carthagena, where he remained plunged in horror at this doleful event. About this time, the cruel Suleiman, having destroyed the family of Musa, had sent an Arab general named Alahor to succeed Abdalisus as emir or governor of Spain. The new emir was of cruel and suspicious nature, and commenced his sway with a stern severity that soon made those under his command look back with regret to the easy rule of Abdalisus. He regarded with an eye of distrust the renegado Christians who had aided in the conquest and who bore arms in the service of the Muslims. But his deepest suspicions fell upon Count Julian. He had been a traitor to his own countrymen, he said. How can we be sure that he will not prove traitor to us? A sudden insurrection of Christians who had taken refuge in the Austrian mountains quickened his suspicions, and inspired him with fears of some dangerous conspiracy against his power. In the height of his anxiety, he bethought him of an Arabian sage named Yuza, who had accompanied him from Africa. This son of science was withered in form, and looked as if he had outlived the usual term of mortal life. In the course of his studies and travels in the East, he had collected the knowledge and experience of sages, being skilled in astrology and, it is said, in necromancy and possessing the marvelous gift of prophecy or divination. To this expounder of mysteries, Alahor applied to learn whether any secret treason menaced his safety. The astrologer listened with deep attentions and overwhelming brow to all the surmises and suspicions of the emir, 
then shut himself up to consult his books and commune with those supernatural intelligences subservient to his wisdom. At an appointed hour the emir sought him in his cell. It was filled with smoke of perfumes. Squares and circles and various diagrams were descried upon the floor, and the astrologer was poring over a scroll of parchment covered with calibristic characters. He received Alahor with a gloomy and sinister aspect, pretending to have discovered fearful proponents in the heavens, and to have had strange dreams and mystic visions. Oh, Amir, said he, be on your guard. Treason is around you, and in your path. Your life is in peril. Beware of Count Julian and his family. Enough, said the emir. They shall all die. Parents and children, all shall die. He forthwith sent a summons to Count Julian to attend him to Cordova. The messenger found him plunged in affliction for the recent death of his daughter. The count excused himself on account of this misfortune from obeying the commands of the emir in person, but sent several of his adherents. His hesitation and the circumstance of his having sent his family across the straits to Africa were construed by the jealous mind of the emir into proofs of guilt. He no longer doubted his being concerned in the recent insurrections, and that he had sent his family away preparatory to an attempt by force of arms to subvert the Muslim dominion. In his fury he put to death Rizabirto and Evan, the nephews of Bishop Opaz, and the sons of the former king Wataza, suspecting them of taking part in the treason. Thus did they expiate their treachery to their country in the fatal battle of Guadalete. Alahor next hastened to Carthagena to seize upon Count Julian. So rapid were his movements that the Count had barely time to escape with fifteen cavaliers, with whom he took refuge in the strong castle of Marcillo, among the mountains of Aragon. The emir, enraged to be disappointed of his prey, embarked at Carthagena and crossed the straits to Cueta to make captives of the Countess Frandina and her son. Now it so happened that the Countess Frandina was seated late at night in her chamber in the citadel of Cueta, which stands on a lofty rock overlooking the sea. She was revolving in gloomy thought the late disasters of her family, when she heard a mournful noise, like that of the sea breeze moaning about the castle walls. Raising her eyes, she beheld her brother, the Bishop of Paz, at the entrance of the chamber. She advanced to embrace him, but he forbade her with a motion of his hand, and she observed that he was ghastly pale and that his eyes glared as with lambent flames. Touch me not, sister, he said, with a mournful voice, lest thou be consumed by the fire which rages within me. Guard well thy son, for bloodhounds are upon his track. His innocence might have secured him the protection of heaven, but our crimes have involved him in our common ruin. He ceased to speak and was no longer to be seen. His coming and going were alike without noise, and the door of the chamber remained fast bolted. On the following morning a messenger arrived with tidings that the Bishop of Paz had been taken prisoner in a battle by the insurgent Christians of the Austrias, and had died in fetters in a tower of the mountains. The same messenger brought word that the emir Alahor had put to death several of the friends of Count Julian had obliged him to fly for his life to a castle in Aragon, and was embarking with a formidable force for Cueta. The Countess Frandina, as has already been shown, was courageous of heart, and danger made her desperate. There were fifty Moorish soldiers in the garrison. She feared that they would prove treacherous and take part with their own countrymen. Summoning her officers, therefore, she informed them of their danger, commanded them to put those moors to death. The guards sallied forth to obey her orders. Thirty-five of those moors were in the great square, unsuspicious of danger, when they were severely singled out by their executioners, and at a concerted signal killed on the spot. The remaining fifteen took refuge in a tower. 
They saw the armada of the emir at a distance, and hoped to be able to hold out until his arrival. The soldiers of the countess saw it also, and made extraordinary efforts to destroy these internal enemies before they should be attacked from without. They made repeated attempts to storm the tower, but were as often repulsed with severe loss. Then they undermined it, supporting its foundations by stanchions of wood. To these they set fire, and withdrew to a distance, keeping up a constant shower of missiles to prevent the moors from sallying forth to extinguish the flames. The stanchions were rapidly consumed, and when they gave way, the tower fell to the ground. Some of the moors were crushed among the ruins, others were flung to a distance and dashed among the rocks. Those who survived were put to the sword. The fleet of the emir arrived about the hour of vespers. He landed, but found the gates closed against him. The countess herself spoke to him from a tower, and set him at defiance. The emir immediately laid siege to the city. He consulted with the astrologer Yuza, who told him that for seven days his star would have the ascendant over that of the youth Alibo, but after that time the youth would be safe from his power and would effect his ruin. Alahor immediately ordered the city to be assailed on every side, and at length carried it by storm. The countess took refuge with her forces in the citadel and made desperate defense, but the walls were sapped and mined, and she saw that all resistance would soon be unavailing. Her only thoughts now were to conceal her child. Surely, she thought, they will not think to seek him among the dead. She led him, therefore, into the dark and dismal chapel. Thou art not afraid to be alone in this darkness, my child, she said. No, mother, replied the boy. Darkness gives silence and sleep. She conducted him to the tomb of Florinda. Fearest thou the dead, my child? No, mother, the dead can do no harm. And what should I fear from my sister? The countess opened the sepulcher. Listen, my son said she. There are fierce and cruel people who have come hither to murder thee. Stay here in company with thy sister, and be quiet as thou dost value thy life. The boy, who was of a courageous nature, did as he was bidden, and remained there all that day and the next night, and the next day until the third hour. In the meantime the walls of the citadel were sapped, and the troops of the emir poured in at the breach and a great part of the garrison was put to the sword. The countess was taken prisoner and brought before the emir. She appeared in his presence with a haughty demeanor, as if she had been a queen receiving homage. But when he demanded her son, she faltered and turned pale, and replied, My son is with the dead. Countess, said the emir, I am not to be deceived. Tell me where you have concealed the boy, or tortures shall wring from you the secret. Emir, replied the countess, may the greatest torments be my portion, both here and hereafter, if what I speak be not the truth. My darling child lies buried with the dead. The emir was confounded by the solemnity of her words, but the withered astrologer Yuza who stood by his side, regarded the countess from beneath his bushed eyebrows, perceived trouble in her countenance and equivocation in her words. Leave this to me, whispered he to Alahor. I will produce the child. He ordered strict search to be made of the soldiery, and he obliged the countess to always be present. When they came to the chapel, her cheek turned pale and her lip quivered. This, said the subtle astrologer, is the place of concealment. The search throughout the chapel, however, was equally vain, and the soldiers were about to depart when Yuza remarked a slight gleam of joy in the eye of the countess. We are leaving our prey behind, thought he. The countess is exulting. He now called to mind the words of her asservation that her child was with the dead. Turning suddenly toward the soldiers, he ordered them to search the sepulchres. If you find him not, said he, draw forth the bones of that wanton kava, that they might be burnt and the ashes scattered to the winds. The soldiers searched among the tombs, and found that of Florinda, 
partly open. Within lay the boy in the sound sleep of childhood, and one of the soldiers took him gently in his arms to bear him to the emir. When the countess beheld that her child was discovered, she rushed into the presence of Alahor, and forgetting all her pride, threw herself upon her knees before him. Mercy! Mercy! cried she, in piercing accents. Mercy on my son, my only child! O oh, emir, listen to a mother's prayers, and my lips shall kiss thy feet. As thou art merciful to him, so may the most high God have mercy upon thee, and heap blessings on thy head. Bear that frantic woman hence, said the emir, but guard her well. The countess was dragged away by the soldiery without regard to her struggles and her cries, and confined in a dungeon of the citadel. The child was now brought to the emir. He had been awakened by the tumult, and gazed fearlessly on the stern countenance of the soldiers. Had the heart of the emir been capable of pity, it would have been touched by the tender youth and innocent beauty of the child. But his heart was as the nether millstone, and he was bent upon the destruction of the whole family of Julian. Calling to him the astrologer, he gave the child into his charge, with a secret command. The withered son of the desert took the boy by the hand and led him up the winding staircase of a tower. When they reached the summit, Yuza placed him on the battlements. Cling not to me, my child, said he. There is no danger. Father, I fear not, said the undaunted boy. Yet it is a wondrous height. The child looked around with delighted eyes. The breeze blew his curling locks from about his face, and his cheeks glowed at the boundless prospect for the tower was raised on that lofty promontory on which Hercules founded one of his pillars. The surges of the sea were heard far below, beating upon the rocks. The seagull screamed and wheeled about the foundations of the tower, and the sails of lofty Caracas were as specks on the deep. "'Dost thou know yonder land beyond the blue water?' said Yusa. "'It is Spain,' replied the boy. "'It is the land of my father and my mother. Then stretch forth thy hands, and bless it, my child, said the astrologer. The boy let go his hold of the wall, and as he stretched forth his hands, the aged son of Ishmael, exerting all the strength of his withered limbs, suddenly pushed him over the battlements. He fell headlong from the top of that tall tower, and not a bone of his tender frame but was crushed upon the rocks beneath. Alahor came to the foot of the winding stairs. Is the boy safe? cried he. He is safe, replied Yuza. Come and behold the truth with thine own eyes. The emir ascended the tower and looked over the battlements, and beheld the body of the child, a shapeless mass on the rocks far below, and the seagulls hovering about it, and he gave orders that it should be thrown into the sea, which was done. On the following, the countess was led forth from her dungeon into the public square. She knew of the death of her child, and that her own death was at hand. But she neither wept nor supplicated. Her hair was disheveled, her eyes were haggard with watching, and her cheek was as the monumental stone, but there were the remains of commanding beauty in her countenance, and the majesty of her presence awed even the rabble into respect. A multitude of Christian prisoners were then brought forth, and Alahor cried out, Behold, the wife of Count Julian. Behold one of the traitorous family from which has brought ruin upon yourselves and upon your country. He ordered that they should stone her to death. But the Christians drew back in horror from the deed, and said, In the hand of God is vengeance. Let not her blood be upon our heads. Upon this, the emir swore with horrid imprecations that whoever of the captives refused should himself be stoned to death. So the cruel order was executed, and the Countess Frandina perished by the hands of her own countrymen. Having thus accomplished this barbarous end, the emir embarked for Spain, and ordered the citadel of Cueda to be set on fire, and crossed the straits at night by the light of its towering flames. The death of Count Julian which took place not long after, 
closed the tragic story of his family. How he died remains in doubt. Some assert that the cruel Alahor pursued him to his retreat among the mountains, and having taken him prisoner, beheaded him. Others that the Moors confined him in a dungeon and put an end to his life with lingering torments. While others affirm that the tower of the castle of Marchulo, near Husqueda, in Aragon, in which he took refuge, fell on him and crushed him to pieces. All agree that his latter end was miserable in the extreme, and his death violent. The curse of heaven, which had thus pursued him to the grave, was extended to the very place which had given him shelter, for we are told that the castle is no longer inhabited on account of the strange and horrible noises that are heard in it, and that visions of armed men are seen above it in the air which are supposed to be the troubled spirits of the apostate Christians who favored the cause of the traitor. In after times, a stone sepulcher was shown outside of the chapel of the castle as the tomb of Count Julian, but the traveler and the pilgrim avoided it or bestowed upon it a malediction, and the name of Julian has remained a byword and a scorn in the land for warning of all generations. Such ever be the lot of him who betrays his country. End of section 5. Recording by Katrina Dixon. Section 6 of The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Lovin. The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4, edited by Siva Smith and Lawrence Labrie. Section 6. Chess Play by Luisa H. Medina. Fiercely the ivory cursor springs around. Check the deep veils and check the hills resound. The Ebon monarch sees his certain fate and yields his throne to ruin and checkmate. A double conquest, Delia. Hast thou won, inspired by Mars and Venus's powerful son? Lo, on the board the one fallen victim dies, and in my heart a surer conquest lies. Philodor's Game of Chess What, not dressed yet, Florence? exclaimed Julia de Guerre as she entered her sister's boudoir on the evening of Madame Elite's conversazione that reunion of all the talent and esprit in Boston. Not yet dressed, and it wants but a quarter of ten. Florence, are you dreaming over that old musty tome? Something of that kind, I confess, said Florence, as with a quiet smile she laid aside the volume. A quarter to ten o'clock. In sooth, it would be more reasonable to prepare for dreaming in good earnest than go abroad at this hour. But possess yourself in patience, Julia, for ten minutes, and my toilette will be made. Is it possible you had forgotten that tonight was the conversazione? I own the soft impeachment, replied Florence, laughing. Good heavens, how singular! Why, I have thought of little else for a week. All the literati will be there. We shall see the author of Lord Iron's Daughter and numbers of distinguished foreigners, she whom they call the English Guicholi, is, I know, invited, and Francis Cleland, too. Oh, Florence, I have set my heart on. But mercy of heavens, Florence, quoth the loquacious young lady, interrupting herself. It is not credible that you are going to the conversazione, that figure? Why not, said her sister, who had turned aside while Julia was enumerating the guests. What's the matter with my figure? The matter? Amiable simplicity, how charming is your naivete. The matter? Just please to look at me. So saying, Julia drew up her stately form opposite the cheval glass, and Florence followed her example. The elder sister was attired in black satin, whose raven gloss made the pure whiteness of her skin the more striking. A deep French blonde shadowed, yet not concealed, the rounded shoulder, and scarcely veiled the molded bosom, which beat with anticipated triumph, her rich auburn hair possessing that peculiar golden tinge so seldom seen but on the feathers of the pheasant, 
was arrayed with leaves and buds of the rose geranium, the deep tinge of the flower being the only color about her dress, and the one uncovered hand blazed with brilliance, gage d'amour and d'amite, perhaps, for alas, gentle reader, the peerless Julia was a sad coquette. Florence, whose charm of person were much inferior, had hastily donned a robe of virgin white, and the purity of the muslin was not freer from spot or stain than the guileless heart which beat beneath the bosom it covered with so maidenly a modesty. Her dark hair was plainly parted over her intellectual brow, and the string of oriental pearls confined its luxuriance. At that hour Florence de Guerre might have stood for a portrait of innocence, and never belied the painter's skill. My dear sister, she said mildly, it is not dress that makes the difference between us. Nature has been beforehand with her, and I fear art would rather aggravate than repair her deficiencies. Come, shall we go? Oh, you are too modest, Florence. Has this book taught you so much diffidence? What is it? The game of chess? Ha! Huh. Well, I shall play a more skillful game than ever chess taught. It shall be for Francis Cleland's heart, for I am resolved to conquer it. Come. Julia's foot was on the carriage step as she spoke, for she always preferred hearing herself talk to receiving answers. So she heard not the low sigh and marked not the crimson blush which her last words had called forth. The sisters were the orphan children of a German, and committed to the care of an aunt residing in America. They had but little fortune, but so great was the beauty and accomplishments of Julia, so sweet the manners of her sister, that their company was eagerly sought by the society in which they mixed. One surpassing skill they equally possessed, the knowledge of chess, to so great and scientific a degree that neither had, as yet, met her equal. A few years ago, chess was not so common an appendage to center tables as now, and even now, to meet a player of extreme skill, especially in a female, is of rare occurrence. Both sisters could play the game without seeing the board, and either undertake three antagonists at once, of an ordinary knowledge in chess. Of course, the young ladies were not without admirers, but the most desired of both was Francis Cleland. Of Julia, because his person, fortune, and standing were all excellent. Of the gentler Florence, because she had learned to love him. The sisters were aware of this tacit rivalry, and both regarded it as a matter of little consequence. The elder was secure in her own charms, the younger too diffident to hope herself worthy of Cleland, even if the beautiful Julia were not her rival. On their arrival to the favored temple of the arts and graces, they met indeed all whose learning or wit could instruct and enliven conversation. Here they heard the quaint remark and the witty retort, the lively attack and the Parthian-like defense, which hits hardest in flight. Here the song and the verse, the recital and the anecdote, joined to make the sands of time like diamond dust sparkle as they passed the magic glass. Cleland was of the guests, and brighter flushed the eyes of Julia and glowed her cheek with a more imperial crimson as he led her to the harp. A few minutes, and the practiced coquette heightened anticipation by vowing like Lady Vernon, her pretty oath by yea and nay, she could not, would not, durst not play and then burst forth the glorious tide of song in the exquisite melody of the Rhine, the Rhine, be blessings on the Rhine, until the listeners' eyes overflowed and their hearts swelled with the unutterable charm of music. And as Cleland led from the instrument the enchantress, she cast a triumphant glance at Florence, on whose pale cheek the white rose deepened to a more death-like hue. Brightly flew the hours, the steps that paced those rooms that night seemed to tread alone on flowers. In every cheek the pleased smile played, from every eye the gentler passion beamed. In each heart pleasure, for the while, had built herself a tower and temple, in all and each save one. There was one loving heart chill as the grave, one heavy eye bent on the floor, one aching head that the sweet music joyed not. Florence de Guerre sat lonely and sad, musing over the broken fabric of gentle wishes, long subdued, subdued, but cherished long. He loves her, 
Yes, he to whom I have dared to raise this forward, erring heart, loves my sister. Am I not justly rebuked for the sin of my presumption? Is she not more worthy of a being on whom every god has set his seal than I am? In sooth, they are lovely. She will not perhaps love quite so well as with this humbler heart, but he loves her, and lo, the mystery and the might of our nature. And shall I love her less because she makes her happiness? Away with the base, the guilty thought. O oh, thou to whom the breathings of a woeful heart may be uplifted, in the crowded throng, or in the silent chamber, hear and assist me, for I will tear this folly from my heart, though every fiber rend as I bid it part forever. Ye who exult in the stern mothers of Sparta, Ye who delight in the blood-stained heroism of ancient lore and call the sacrificing trophies of an unnatural pride glorious, look here for the reality. It is such trophies as our misguided passions that it becomes us to lay on the altar of faith. The sacrifice of God is a broken and contrite spirit. Scarcely had Florence nerved herself for the worst of warfares, a struggle with ourselves, when several of the leading members of the company present approached her eagerly. As she could neither sing, or play, or raconte to amuse the guests, she had hitherto been left almost unnoticed by the fashionable hostess. But now that lady led the approaching van, and with persuasive accents besought her charming young friend to grant the general wish of all present. This was to play a game of chess with her sister. Frequently had they played in public, but never opposed each other. Julia, who always thought herself the superior, consented carelessly to oblige the general request, the rather, as the admiring Cleland was pouring into her ear his admiration of the game and the conviction of her skill. Assuredly, Florence would not have chosen to become thus a public object of attention. The wound in her heart was sore, and she would fain have tended it with solitude and prayer. But to give up her own pleasure was nothing new to her self-sacrificing spirit, and she submitted quietly, although not without a remark that Julia was her superior in the art. She is superior in everything, exclaimed Cleland. Flatterer, silence, said Julia, as he dressed the board for her. Say that I should not conquer? You would be a false prophet. Not conquer, you, returned he passionately. What could you not conquer if you condescended to try? You must preserve silence, Mr. Cleland, said an old gentleman who observed careering to and fro in Florence's cheek the wayward blood that would not be controlled. It is impossible to play chess if anyone speaks a syllable. On account of the great length of the game, a situation was chosen from Philidor, where both sides had equally lost and neither possessed any advantage. But alas, for poor Florence, notwithstanding her real desire to play well, her heart was a traitor, and soon she lost the manifest advantage, almost with the oversight of an ordinary player. She allowed the adversary's knight to check her king and queen, thereby inevitably losing the finest piece on the board. Relentlessly did Julia pursue the chance, forgetful even of her admirer. Nay, more, momently forgetting herself, she bent every energy to the game, claiming each trifling privilege in tones by no means dulcet, and displaying a triumphant exultation at winning incompatible with a generous nature. Like many other conquering general, she pursued her victory too far, for not content with conquest, she suffered her wit to exhale in sarcasm and taunted her sister's dullness. Heavens, Florence, what a move! Why, there is no triumph in conquering you. All the pride of victory is its doubt and difficulty. Cleland moved a little further off. There again, good night to you, Bishop. Why, sister, surely you must be in love. Is she not now, Mr. Cleland? Or she could not move so. This was the unkindest cut of all, and fairly roused Florence to exertion. Her eyes beamed proudly as she replied, 
Not in love with conquest, at least, Julia. However, I will try to do better now. Those who play the game are aware that nothing depends in chance or fortune. All is cool, calculating skill. Therefore, chess is the hardest game extant to lose it with patience, since it is a fair confession of inferior intellect. Florence bestirred herself in earnest. Julia flushed with certainty, had much relaxed her care, and soon lost several advantages. What was far worse, she lost her temper with them. Cleland, who was himself an excellent player, admired the wonderful skill which brought up again and combined the broken elements of Florence's game, nor could he forbear to contrast the pettish ill humor of the loser against what had been the insulting triumph of the winner. Another instance forced the moderation of Florence upon his attention. Julia was about to castle. This was the very worst thing she could have done, but her rapidly increasing temper blinded her judgment. Florence touched the queen, indicating her danger by a gesture so slight that none but he observed it, and saved Julia from total ruin. Her sister accepted the obligation as silently. Slight as such a sacrifice may seem, at chess it is enormous. Many a player would sooner give a hundred guineas than sustain a loss at chess. Many old friends has a game of chess severed, and married people should hold it in utterly forbidden pleasure. Both were now trying hard, but the impatience of Julia was driving forward the plan for checkmate, without observing that by a covert maneuver of her antagonist, she herself stood without the move of loss. Come, play, play, you are so long, Florence, she exclaimed angrily. All was suspense. Those who had the skill to perceive the situation held their breaths. Cleland's eyes were riveted on Julia to observe how she could bear the loss. Florence saw the hairbreadth's chance. She looked up once to the flushed face of Julia and saw Cleland's eyes fastened there. She thought, why should I paint them both? Who cares if I win or lose? Then, with a sudden motion of her arm, she swept the remaining men, exclaiming, I will not wait for the knell of checkmate. I have lost, lost, lost. Proudly and exultingly, Julia arose, telling her sister that she was a vain thing not to allow her the pride of her hardly won conquest. Cleland glanced from her face, on which erstwhile every angry passion had set their seal, and were now succeeded by the no less despicable ones of paltry pride and mean jealousy, to that of Florence, as she sat arranging the men in their box, alone and unnoticed. On her placid brow sat moral beauty. Around her lips a smile of benevolence lingered like the sunlight on a pleasant scene. And if something of sadness was there, it would not long for animation. When she raised her eyes and beheld him, looking intensely and improvingly upon her. Cleland watched the varying blush, not the proud glow of vanity, but the timid maidenly suffusion of a gentle spirit. And he marveled much how he could have thought Julia handsomer than Florence. Three months after that conversazione, Florence de Guerre was Cleland's wife, and her happy husband, rich in the possession of a virtuous and loving heart, often blessed heaven that she that night lost the game of chess play. End of section six. Section seven of the Rover, volume one, number four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rover, Volume 1, Number 4, edited by Seba Smith and Lawrence Labrie, Section 7. Zoe, A Tale of the Youth of Julius Caesar. It was almost midnight. The party had separated. Catiline and Cathegus were still conferring in the supper-room, which was, as usual, the highest apartment of the house, it formed a cupola from which windows opened on the flat roof that surrounded it to this terrace zoe had retired 
with eyes dimmed by fond and melancholy tears she leaned over the balustrades to catch the last glimpse of the departing form of caesar as it grew more and more indistinct in the moonlight had he any thought of her any love for her he the favourite of the high-born beauties of rome the most splendid the most graceful the most eloquent of its nobles it could not be his voice had indeed been touchingly soft whenever he addressed her there had been a fascinating tenderness even in the vivacity of his look and conversation but such were always the manners of caesar toward women he had wreathed a sprig of myrtle in her hair as she was singing she took it from her dark ringlets and kissed it and wept over it and thought of the sweet legends of her own dear greece of youths and girls who pining away in hopeless love had been transformed into flowers by the compassions of the gods and she wished to become a flower which caesar might sometimes touch though he should touch it only to weave a crown for some prouder and happier mistress she was roused from her musings by the loud step and voice of cathegus who was pacing furiously up and down the supper-room may all the gods confound me if caesar be not the deepest traitor or the most miserable idiot that ever intermeddled with a plot zoe shuddered she drew nearer to the window she stood concealed from observation by the curtain of a fine network which hung over the aperture to exclude the annoying insects of the climate and you too continued cathegus turning fiercely on his accomplice you take his part against me you who propose the scheme yourself my dear caius cathegus you will not understand me i propose the scheme and i will join in executing it but policy is as necessary to our plans as boldness i did not wish to startle caesar to lose his cooperation perhaps to send him off with an information against us to cicero and catullus he was so indignant at your suggestion that all my dissimulation was scarcely sufficient to prevent a total rupture indignant the gods confound him he prated about humanity and generosity and moderation by hercules i have not heard such a lecture since i was with xenocates at rhodes caesar is made up of inconsistencies he has boundless ambition unquestioned courage admirable sagacity yet i have frequently observed in him a womanish weakness at the sight of pain i remember that once one of his slaves was taken ill while carrying his litter he alighted put the fellow in his place and walked home in a fall of snow i wonder that you could be so ill-advised as to talk to him of massacre and pillage and conflagration you might have foreseen that such propositions would disgust a man of his temper i do not know i have not yet your self-command lucius i hate such conspirators what is the use of them we must have blood blood hacking and tearing work bloody work do not grind your teeth my dear caius and lay down your carving knife by hercules you have cut up all the stuffing of the couch no matter we shall have couches enough soon and down to stuff them with and pretty women to loll on them unless this fool and such as he spoil our plans i had something else to say this essenced fop wishes to seduce zoe from me impossible you misconstrue the ordinary gallantries which he is in the habit of paying to every handsome face curse on his ordinary gallantries and his verses and his compliments and his sprigs of myrtle if caesar should dare by hercules i will tear him to pieces in the middle of the forum trust his destruction to me we must use his talents and influence thrust him upon every danger make him our instrument while we are contending our peace offering to the senate if we fail our first victim if we succeed hark what noise was that somebody in the terrace lend me your dagger catiline rushed to the window zoe was standing in the shade he stepped out she darted into the room passed like lightning by the startled cathegus flew down the stairs through the court through the vestibule through the street steps voices lights came fast and confusedly behind her but with the speed of love and terror she gained upon her pursuers 
she fled through the wilderness of unknown and dusky streets till she found herself breathless and exhausted in the midst of a crowd of gallants who with chaplets on their heads and torches in their hands were reeling from the portico of a stately mansion the foremost of the throng was a youth whose slender figure and beautiful countenance seemed hardly consistent with his sex but the feminine delicacy of his features rendered more frightful the mingled sensuality and ferocity of their expression the libertine audacity of his stare and the grotesque foppery of his apparel seemed to indicate at least a partial insanity flinging one arm round zoe and tearing away her veil with the other he disclosed to the gaze of his thronging companions the regular features and large dark eyes which characterized athenian beauty clodius has all the luck to-night cried ligarius not so by hercules said marcus Celius. the girl is fairly our common prize we will fling dice for her the venus throw as it ought to do shall decide let me go let me go for heaven's sake cried zoe struggling with clodius what a charming greek accent she has come into the house my little athenian nightingale oh what will become of me if you have mothers if you have sisters clodius has a sister muttered ligarius or he is much belied by heavens she is weeping said clodius if she were not evidently a greek said Celius, i should take her for a vestal virgin and if she were a vestal virgin cried clodius fiercely it should not deter me this way no struggling no screaming struggling screaming exclaimed a gay and commanding voice you are making very ungentle love clodius the whole party started caesar had mingled with them unperceived the sound of his voice thrilled through the very heart of zoe with a convulsive effort she burst from the grasp of her insolent admirer flung herself at the feet of caesar and clasped his knees the moon shone full on her agitated and imploring face her lips moved but she uttered no sound he gazed at her for an instant raised her clasped her to his bosom fear nothing my sweet zoe then with folded arms and a smile of placid defiance he placed himself between her and clodius clodius staggered forward flushed with wine and rage uttering alternately a curse and a hiccup by pollux this pass as a jest caesar how dare you insult me thus in jest i am as serious as a jew on the sabbath insult you for such a pair of eyes i would insult the whole consular bench or i should be as insensible as king Samis's mummy good god caesar said marcus Celius, interposing you cannot think it worth while to get into a brawl for a little greek girl why not the greek girls have used me as well as rome besides the whole reputation of my gallantry is at stake give up such a lovely woman to that drunken boy my character would be gone for ever no more perfumed tablets full of vows and raptures no more toying with fingers at the circus no more evening walks along the tiber no more hiding in chests or jumping from windows i the favoured suitor of half the white stoles in rome could never again aspire above a freed woman you a man of gallantry and think of such a thing for shame my dear Celius. do not let clodia hear of it while caesar spoke he had been engaged in keeping clodius at arm's length the rage of the frantic libertine increased as the struggle continued stand back as you value your life he cried i will pass not this way sweet clodius i have too much regard for you to suffer you to make love at such a disadvantage you smell too much of falernian at present would you stifle your mistress by hercules you are fit to kiss nobody now except old piso when he is rumbling home in the morning from the vintners clodius plunged his hand into his bosom and drew a little dagger the faithful companion of many desperate adventures o oh, gods he will be murdered cried zoe the whole throng of revellers was in agitation the street fluctuated with torches and lifted hands it was but for a moment caesar watched with a steady eye the descending hand of clodius arrested the blow seized his antagonist by the throat and flung him against one of the pillars of the portico with such a violence that he rolled stunned and senseless on the ground he is killed cried several voices fear self-defence by hercules said marcus Celius. bear witness you all saw him draw his dagger he is not dead 
ebris said ligarius carry him into the house he is dreadfully bruised the rest of the party retired with clodius Celius turned to caesar by all the gods caesar you have won your lady fairly a splendid victory you deserve a triumph what a madman has clodius become intolerable but come and sup with me on the nons you have no objection to meet the consul cicero none at all we need not talk politics our old dispute about plato and epicurus will furnish us plenty of conversation so reckon upon me my dear marcus and farewell caesar you are in danger i know all I overheard catiline and cathegus you are engaged in a project which must lead you to certain destruction my beautiful zoe i live only for glory and pleasure for these i have never hesitated to hazard an existence which they alone render valuable to me in the present case i can assure you that our scheme presents the fairest hopes of success so much the worse you do not know you do not understand me i speak not of open peril but of secret treachery catiline hates you cathegus hates you your destruction is resolved if you survive the contest you perish in the first hour of victory they detest you for your moderation they are eager for blood and plunder i have risked my life to bring you this warning but that is of little moment farewell be happy caesar stopped her do you fly from my thanks dear zoe i wish not your thanks but for your safety i desire not to defraud valeria or a servilia of one caress extorted from gratitude or pity be my feelings what they may i have learned in a fearful school to endure and suppress them i have been taught to abase a proud spirit to the clasps and hisses of the vulgar to smile on suitors who united the insults of a despicable pride to the endearments of a despicable fondness to affect sprightliness with an aching head and eyes from which tears were ready to rush to feign love when curses were on my lips and madness in my brain who feels for me any esteem any tenderness who will shed a tear over the nameless grave which will soon shelter from cruelty and scorn the broken heart of the poor athenian girl but you who alone have addressed her in her degradation with a voice of kindness and respect farewell sometimes think of me not with sorrow no i could bear your ingratitude but not your distress yet if it will not pain too much in distant days when your lofty hopes and destinies are accomplished on the evening of some mighty victory in the chariot of some magnificent triumph think on one who loved you with that exceeding love which only the miserable can feel think that wherever her exhausted frame may have sunk beneath the sensibilities of a tortured spirit in whatever hovel or whatever vault she may have closed her eyes whatever strange scenes of horror and infamy may have surrounded her dying bed your shape was the last that swam before her sight your voice the last sound that was ringing in her ears yet turn your face to me caesar let me carry away one last look of those features and then he turned round he hid his face on her bosom and burst into tears with sobs long and loud and convulsive as those of a terrified child he poured forth the tribute of impetuous and uncontrollable emotion he raised his head but in vain struggled to restore composure to the brow which had confronted the frown of scylla and the lips which had rivalled the eloquence of cicero he several times attempted to speak but in vain and his voice still faltered with tenderness when after a pause of several minutes he thus addressed her my own dear zoe your love has been bestowed on one who if he cannot merit can at least appreciate and adore you beings of similar loveliness and similar devotedness of affection mingled in all my boy's dreams of greatness with visions of carule chairs and ivory cars marshalled legions and fasces such i have endeavoured to find in the world and in their stead i have met with selfishness with vanity with frivolity with falsehood the life which you have preserved is a boon less valuable than the affection o oh, caesar interrupted the blushing zoe think only on your own security at present if you feel as you speak but you are only mocking me or perhaps your compassion by heaven by every oath that is binding 
alas alas caesar were not all the same oaths sworn yesterday to valeria but i will trust you at least so far as to partake your present dangers flight may be necessary form your plans be they what they may there is one who in exile in poverty and peril asks only to wander to beg to die with you my zoe i do not anticipate any such necessity to renounce the conspiracy without renouncing the principles on which it was originally undertaken to elude the vengeance of the senate without losing the confidence of the people is indeed an arduous but not an impossible task i owe it to myself and to my country to make the attempt there is still ample time for consideration at present i am too happy in love to think of ambition or danger they had reached the door of a stately palace caesar struck it it was instantly opened by a slave so he found herself in a magnificent hall surrounded by pillars of green marble between which were ranged the statues of the long line of julian nobles call endymion said caesar the confidential freedman made his appearance not without a slight smile which his patron's good nature emboldened him to hazard at seeing the beautiful athenian arm my slaves endymion there are reasons for precaution let them relieve each other on guard during the night zoe my love my preserver why are your cheeks so pale let me kiss some bloom into them how you tremble endymion a flask of samian and some fruit bring them to my apartments this way my sweet zoe End of section seven section eight of the rover volume one number four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rover volume one number four edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section eight the maid of malahide the dark-eyed maid of malahide her silken bodice laced and on her brow with virgin pride the bridal chaplet placed her heart is beating high her cheek is flushed with rosy shame as laughing bridesmaids slyly speak the gallant bridegroom's name the dark-eyed maid of malahide before the altar stands and galtrim claims his blushing bride from pure and holy hands but hark what fearful sounds are those to arms to arms they cry the bride's sweet cheek no longer glows fear sits in that young eye the gallants all are mustering now the bridegroom's helm is on one look upon that wreathed brow one kiss and he is gone the feast is spread but many a night that should have graced that hall will sleep anon in cold moonlight beneath a gory pall the garlands bright with rainbow dyes in gay festoons are hung the starry lamps outshine the skies the golden harps are strung but she the moving spring of all hath sympathy with none that meet in that old festive hall and now the feast's begun hark to the clang of arms is he the bridegroom chief returned crowned with the wreath of victory by his good weapon turned victorious bands indeed return but on their shields they bear the laurel chief and melt though stern at that young bride's despair take take the roses from my brow the jewels from my waist i have no need of such things now and then her cheek she placed close to his dead cold cheek and wept as one may wildly weep when the last hope the heart had kept lies buried in the deep long years have passed since that young bride bewailed her widowed doom the holy walls of malahide still shrine her marble tomb the sculpture there has sought to prove with rude essay of art what form she wore in life whose love did grace her woman's heart 
End of section 8. Recording by Alan Mapstone. End of the Rover, volume 1, number 4. Edited by Sabre Smith and Lawrence Labrie.